All right, so my name is, as uh, Dimitri told, my name is Vlad Mihalcha, and uh, today we are going to talk about transactions and concurrency control. One second to turn it. First, a little bit about myself. I come from Transylvania, you know. You have to admit, this is probably one of the coolest logo they have for the, for, for, for the Duke, yeah. Uh, I work for the Hibernate project, I'm a Java champion, and I do a lot of writing also on my blog, and I wrote this book, High Performance Java Persistence, which this presentation is also based on. Yeah, that the one does not work very well, so I'll change from here. Okay, so now the first thing I want to talk about, yeah, when you're thinking about security, you know that the lack of security can lead to stuff like your application getting hacked and losing money. However, few people realize that that can happen also because of lack of proper concurrency control. And there was a this one, Flexcoin, used to be a, an e-wallet for Bitcoins, and in 2014, it got hacked, so they had to shut down, because they lost all their Bitcoins in, the stock, in their exchange they had there, around $600,000. And they even, on WebArchive, they even have some um, post-mortem um, article that they wrote there. So they said there was a flaw in the application, and the hackers sent thousands of simultaneous transactions, which were not properly balanced. And in the end, the hacker could withdraw more money than they had in the original account, which led to, to this theft. And actually, this is not the first one. In the same period of time, there was this uh, Bitcoin exchange, Poloniex, which also got hacked and they lost 12% of all their Bitcoins. And they provide on the internet uh, a lot of uh, input related to what, uh, what actually what went wrong. But it's actually, if you read it, it's still the same thing. Due to concurrency control, they lost, they lost quite uh, a lot of money. So in this uh, article they wrote, they said that if the hacker placed several withdraw uh, at the same time, the source account resulted in a negative balance, and then they got more money out of that, that account, which they managed to withdraw. So it's still the same thing. It's a concurrency control issue. So because of this, I think that's the, the reason why I gave this presentation is because it's very, actually, it's very important. No matter what database you are using, it's very important to acknowledge the thing that concurrency control can play a very important role in your application. OK, so now. What's nice about it is that we can even uh, test it and demonstrate what really happened with this tech exchange. Because you know, theory is one thing, uh, in practice, pr practice looks different. So what we have here, we have a method, a transfer, we, and we want to withdraw from one account to, one, uh, to a different account. There's a sum of money. So basically, the, uh, the operation is very easy. We just read the balance. If we have enough money in the account, then we will withdraw from one account, and then we will add to the, to the other account. And let's run the test to see what we're talking about. So yeah, the reason why I'm using entities here is not because I use Hibernate for this example. It's just because I want to have it running on every database without having to create the initial script. So basically, this account, what it has, it's just simple, like you saw, it has uh, an IBAN, an owner, and a particular balance. And then we are creating two accounts. You know, Alice has one account. She has $10 in their uh, account. And then we have Bob, which does not have anything. And we, this is the transfer method you already, you already saw. It looks uh, pretty much uh, straightforward. It is, that's exactly what we want. And here we, we have a very simple method to read the balance. It's just uh, JDBC. We just select the balance from the particular account for this uh, IBAN. And then adding a balance, we just issue a single update statement. You see, for that particular balance, we either add a negative or a positive. So everything looks pretty much standard. And because we want, uh, we, we want to test to make sure that it works, we even wrote a test, which actually does exactly like that. So you have, at first, we validate that we have $10 in Alice and zero. We withdraw five, so we should have five, five. Then we would withdraw another five, so we have zero and 10, which makes sense. So if we try to withdraw more from Alice's account, that should not work. So if we run this test, it should work. Well, let's run it to see how it works. IntelliJ idea. 
everything was expected. So now we can go back home and say that the task is done, you can move pushed it in Jira from to do to done, and your job is done. However, we have not tested it for concurrency, so let's, let's, let's write another test. So here, we start again from 10, and we have 10 in Alice, we have Bob has zero, and then we do it in parallel. So the parallel execution looks something like that. So we have, when you're doing parallel testing, countdown latches, cyclic barriers are very, very useful. Here, the start latch, the countdown latch, allows you to start all worker threads at the same moment of time. And then the end latch is used for the main thread to wait for all the worker thread to process. So what we are doing, we are starting several thread counts. Each one will try to do the transfer. And at the end, in the test method, we will try to see what balance we can observe for Alice and uh, for Bob. So let's, r let's run it to see, to see what happens. Okay, so I'll just wait a second to move this one. Okay, so you see Alice balance minus 10, Bob's balance 20. Okay, so it's already, it's already wrong. But let's, let's just move this to more threads and run it again. So now let's run it with 16 threads. Did you expect to work that, like that? So now, you see, this is how Bob can really get rich. Because now it has 40. The more threads we start, the more money we can withdraw. Let's start with, let's, let's do it with 128. So that's exactly what happened for Poloniex and Flexcoin. This is exactly the same thing. We can even replicate on, uh, on, a, on this very simple test. So that's nothing uh, out of the ordinary. So you see, now we have $130. You can easily go to 168 Bitcoins, uh, which uh, was for Flexicoin. So you don't need a lot of uh, worker thread. So now, what went wrong? Th this was a relational database. We know that relational databases are acid, right? So th they are meant to protect us against these things. We didn't run this test on, I don't know, some NoSQL database, which does not provide asset guarantees, and it still didn't work. And to understand why it happened like that, you have to understand that ACID, which is offered by relational database, is just a tool. In the end, you have to use it properly. If you do not use it properly, you get something like this one. You can try to, uh, if you have a screw and try to hammer it, it will work up until, until uh, eventually it will break. So here the problem which we had is that the read and the check that we done, actually the read was done in one transaction, and then the write happened in a different transaction. And ACID can only help you if you're doing all the reads and the writes in the same transaction. So no matter what isolation level we would use for this example, it will still break because it was the code that was written in such a way that could not benefit from what the database uh, uh, had to offer you. Okay, so to understand this, the read and write were executed in separate transactions, and the whole, even, uh, at first we only had one test, which was proven to work. However, it was proven to work on only one thread. So it was a false impression that we got that it will work all the time. When we tested it with concurrency, which, let's, be, let's face it, how many times do, do you have tests in, your, uh, in all your code base to test what happens when you have multiple threads trying to do something with the application? Because it's not, Usually, this is not the norm. So, because we didn't have any no concurrency testing, we could not spot the issue. And you might think that this is something out of the ordinary, and who who would write a code like that, right? Uh, however, Peter Bailey's wrote a paper. It's called Acid Rain, and he analyzed 12 open source e-commerce uh, frameworks for different from different programming languages. And out of 12, only one did not have any vulnerability. The rest, 11 of them, had one, two, or three vulner vulnerabilities. And those are open source uh, projects, which anyone can review and uh, figure out how they work. But think about the projects which you don't see, which are commercial, pro pro -commercial products, or products which are developed in-house, and you don't uh, get to see uh, what happens there. So actually, the, what can we do about it? You know, when, when you go into a conference, you are going to see speakers 
talking about microservices, serverless stuff, which is new. I'm going to talk about boring stuff, you know, like databases, uh, concurrency control. Because if you have data, data is very precious to your business. And you don't want fancy technologies to handle your data. You want something that's boring and that is, it, it has proven to work over time. Because as you will see, the first thing that we have about transaction is from 1981. Actually, this paper is just a little bit older than I am. So we've been having this almost for 40 years. Does anyone in the room know who was Jim Gray? No, no, no one? <laughs> no one. Yeah, Jim Gray won, won the Alan Turing Award. Actually, what we have about transaction, we owe to him, to Jim Gray. He and other people at IBM, they created a system R. The first, uh, it was the first prototype that uh, demonstrated that you can actually build a relational database. So that was only the th a theory at first. They actually they demonstrated that uh, you can even have it. And in order to 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 have, uh, in order to 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 guard the data, to have integrity, he uh, he stated in 1981 that transaction should be should have atomicity, durability, and consistency. But these are just terms. Let's see what. What exactly those means? So atomicity out of all is the simplest of all. You can you have multiple statements which you wrap inside a single unit of work. Either everything works, or if any one of them fails, then you are going to roll back and uh, nothing has changed. Basically, you want to move the database from one consistent state to the other. So that if you have an, in, in, an inconsistency, you have to go back to the previous state. Consistency. This is a very. Uh, th this is one term which is used in different contexts and has completely different meanings. In the in the context of acid, when you hear consistency, you have to think about constraints. What constraints like column types, the length of the column, uh, nullability, foreign key constraints. So these. So, or, or for instance, in our example, you can have. Whoops. You can have. No. Like that, you can have a custom custom constraint. If we add this to our test case, it will it will it will be impossible for for both to move more money because even if you have multiple threads, the transaction will have to roll back because if the balance goes below zero, it will have to throw an exception. So even custom constraints uh, enter the same uh, in the in the same category. The third one, which was enumerated back then. 40 years ago by, by Jim Gray is durability. Now I think, why do I need this durability? Because all my data is, uh, on, the opera is on the hardware anyway, which is durable. However, when you read, reading data and writing data to the hardware, even to solid state drive, is very slow. Compared to memory, it's 10,000 times slower to write to the, even to a solid state drive than to, to memory. So for this reason, all databases, not just relational, even NoSQL have the same. They have some in-memory buffer where you are caching your data. When you're loading something, you're loading from disk, indexes, pages of uh, data from your tables, you're loading them in memory, and you try to keep their, the working set as long as possible. When you do modifications, you modify the ones in memory, and during commit, you don't flush, because if you flush all the time, if you have 100 transactions per second, it means you have to have sync 100 times. And those writes should go to random, arbitrary position, and that will take a lot of time. So the database does not do that. It changes data in memory, and only, for instance, in PostgreSQL, only if at five minutes you flush data from memory. So what happens if we unplug the, the, the cable from the Postgres? We are going to lose the in-memory buffers, right? So to have durability, we need a redo log. So when we commit, we also write in the redo log what has changed for a transaction. So if we unplug the cable, we have to replay all the events since the last time we have managed to, to flush, which is called a checkpoint. However, writing randomly is slow. Writing sequentially to a log is fast. That's why it works like that. And the undo log is for atomicity, because when you modify something, you modify directly. And if you want to roll back, you have to know what was the previous state. To know the previous state, to roll back to. So that's how durability. However, we haven't talked about concurrency. And in our example, this is exactly what 
the problem was. We had a concurrency problem. When you have shared resources and multiple connections, you need a way to, to schedule operations in such a way that you don't get conflicts. Otherwise, you get conflicts and you might lose data. The easiest one of all to handle and to fix all concurrency control problems is that you don't have any concurrency. So if you don't have concurrency, you don't have any concurrency control problem. And actually, databases like VoLDB, that's how they work. They work like Node.js, where you have one event loop thread and does all the things. But that works because everything you do is in memory, and working in memory is extremely fast. As long as you're not going to disk, you can do that. That's why, for instance, you have the, that event loop, and it said that you should not do I.O in that event loop. You should use a separate thread, because that's how it works. That's exactly how it also works in VoLDB. So no concurrency, no problem. It works something like that. Alice has exclusive access to the application. She does all the reads. She does all the writes. And then Bob, Bob comes. He does the reads. He does the writes. That's serial execution. However, the databases don't work like that. You have multiple connections to the database. All databases allow you to open multiple connections to operate in the same time with multiple users, and every user can do whatever they want. So you need a way to control. And in 1981, they thought of this serializability thing. So they said that we can allow a degree of parallelism. We can interleave reads and writes. So as long as we guarantee that the read and writes are interleaved and they create a transactional log, which is equivalent to some, some, one serial execution, because there can be many of them. You have many connections, many reads, many writes. There are many ways you can combine them. As long as they're uh, equivalent to some serial execution, it means that data was not, uh, th there was no anomaly. And, and this was, in, in this paper, uh, Jim Graven said that uh, uh, he reasoned about multiple ways about implementing this. So he, he said that the using locks, you know, reads and write locks is the easiest one, uh, easiest method to, to provide that. And that's how most database systems work. No matter what concurrency control mechanism use, there are always going to be some locks that are taken. So you have shared or read locks and exclusive or write locks. This is exactly like read, write, lock you have in Java util concurrent, the same library. So how do that work? Read, when you have a read lock, you can take another read lock, but you block writers. So when you have a write lock, you block both readers and writers. And that is called... This when you use that with read and writes, so on every read you take the read lock, on every write you take the write lock, you get two-phase locking, which was the original and it's the oldest implementation for concurrency control. And the only, uh, the only thing real, uh, other than how read and write locks are locking is that you have to make sure that only during commit or rollback, after commit and rollback, you release all the locks. So this one guarantees that you have the strictest, the golden standard in uh, strong consistency, which is not serializability, is strict serializability. Sp actually, you have two of them. On the right, you have on relational databases how read and writes should be interleaved, are allowed to be interleaved. On the left, you have how data is allowed to, uh, how, how fast are you going to, to read something that is changed. That's where you have linearizability. So you have, if you combine linearizability and serializability, you get strict serializability, which provides you not only that reads and writes are equivalent to a serial execution, but even their order is the same order in time which you executed. And it's very easy to write software if you have strict serializability, because what you see is exactly how it's going to be executed. Now, this linearizability, to understand what it means, you have to, if you have in a system, you have replication, or you have a primary and a follower, and you have an asynchronous replication between the nodes. So now you're updating a record on the primary. So now you're deducting 40 from the account, so you are going to have 10. The time flows from left to right. Now Bob comes, he will read from the follower, 50, because the replication did not get a chance to kick in. Now, replication comes in, updates, even on the follower node. And now you are going to withdraw, knowing that you, you, you saw you had 50 in the account. So now if you withdraw 40, you will get minus 30. So because of lack of linearizability, you can get these issues. So to get these visibility issues, you have to have more than one node to do that. 
And this is, does not apply only to databases. Even in Java, you have that. Reason and writes are not linearizable in Java. You need to use volatile to have them because you have caches. When you're writing something, it might go to the cache. It might not go to, to the main memory. So when someone reads data, it might read from the cache, from other CPU cache, a uh, different value. So even, even in programming languages, it's not like always you have linearizable reads and writes. However, there's a problem with locking, with two-phase locking. It works great, you have strong consistency, but it does not scale very well because you have too much locking. You are going to limit the way you can parallelize. Have you heard of Amdahl's law? Someone? I, I, I saw a hand. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, someone heard of, there are people hurting, but have you heard of universal scalability law? Someone has heard of it. So that's the, th that's the one you should know about, not Amdahl's law. Amdahl's law is just, just a generalization of universal scalability law. If you think about Amdahl's law, it only tells you that if you're using locks, you will affect parallelism. But if you take a look on the graph, parallelism goes to infinity, which is not true in a finite system with finite resources. You cannot scale infinitely. So that's where universal scalability law tells you that if you increase the number of database connections, if you increase concurrency, if you increase the number of threads in the JVM, the performance will get worse. And you can easily test it. You have your, in, in your JVM, you start a program, you start 10,000 threads trying to do one operation, and you see it works worse than if you have four threads because of too much context uh, switching and too much coherency costs between CPU caches. And that's why so you have a maximum of concurrency that you can achieve in a finite system. And if you, try to reduce the locking, you can scale a little bit better. And if you think about that paper when it was wrote in 1981, the context was something like that. They had 10,000 terminals, the largest deployment of their databases with 100 active transactions. Now you can even have more than that. If, you ha you, if you're having like the, the biggest real estate uh, platform in Bulgaria, surely you have more than that, more than 100 users at the time and more than uh, 10,000 uh, possible browsers trying to access or reading that, uh, that application every day. So because of this, they had to invent, the researcher invented different mechanisms to allow you to, to give you something like serializability. So that's how you went from two-phase locking to MVCC. So th this, is not, this is not something new. It also happened. Oracle had this since 1984, so it's still uh, very old, uh, a very old thing that we've been having. And to understand it, the corollary for MVCC is something like that. Readers no longer block writers, and writers no longer uh, block readers. The only way to block is when, write, when you write something, you have to block other thread trying to lock the same thing. Because if you do that during rollback, you would not know exactly what is the consistent state to go back to. Now, to understand how MVCC works, the best way to see it is in PostgreSQL. Because in PostgreSQL, besides all the columns you have in a table, the one you created, you have more columns. You, and two of them, extra columns, are called xmin and xmax. For instance, when you're doing an insert, you're writing the xmin columns, meaning that this is the transaction that wrote it. So only afterwards, if you have a transaction ID which is larger than this one, you'd be allowed to see the record. So here, for instance, if uh, after, for instance, uh, Alice uh, inserts a record, when they go to read it, they can read their own record, but until they commit it, commit it, Bob cannot read it. And afterward, Bob can read it because his transaction ID is bigger than Alice's transaction. So that's how the insert goes. For delete, you have the other, the X max that's used. So you start from a record. Now, Bob deletes it, and it, you will see when you delete something, nothing is physically deleted. You, just, you are just soft deleting in PostgreSQL. You're just marking a column. It's a very cheap operation. So now when you try to read it, you will not see it. Bob will, is not going to see it. Alice is still going to see it because it's, uh, the record is still there. It's just that you are playing with the visibility using those two columns. So only after you commit, uh, Alice is not going to see the record as well. And the update is a combination of delete and insert. So you start from a record, and you're doing the update, so you're going to delete the old record, 
and insert the new one. So until you commit, you can see the new version that you modified, and the others will see the old version. That's why it's called multi-version concurrency control, because at the same time, you can have multiple versions of the same record. And this, of course, as you've, as you've seen uh, previously for two-phase locking, now we're not taking any locks. So if you modify something, you're not locking. The others can still see the old version. And if I modify something, I'm not going to block it. So both reads and writes are not going to, to conflict anymore. OK, so there are two in MVCC, there are two, actually there are only two types of uh, modes which you can work on depending on where you put, where you are referencing your timestamp. So you can reference the start. The point of reference can be the start of the query, and then you get read committed. Or you can uh, place the, the, the time, the time stamp reference to the beginning of the transaction, and then you don't get serializable. You get a quite strong isolation level, but not as strong as serializable, which is called snapshot isolation. And you have to, of course, if, if you, uh, as you saw in that picture, you have to make sure that uh, the garbage collector process, because now you have multiple versions and you're soft deleting, you need some garbage collector process, like in Java, which is called vacuum in PostgreSQL. You need to have that to reclaim the old tuples, which are no longer referenced. So you have to watch out for long-running transactions, because otherwise those can, uh, can be, um, are not going to be reclaimed. So now, if we have this problem where you have Alice and Bob, and they both have, they are working in a department where they have employees and the budget is 100,000. Currently, the budget is 90,000. So now, uh, Alice reads all the salaries, which is our 90,000. Bob comes in, tries, reads the same, tries to do the insert. And now we're in two-phase locking. We cannot modify because Alice took the lock. So we have to wait. If uh, Alice does not release the lock, we are going to time out, roll back. And then Alice is going to issue the update. So here we are preventing the anomaly. So at the end, the budget is 99. It's below 100,000, which is exactly what we wanted. In MVCC, we don't take any locks. So we read. And then Bob can also read. They can even modify the range. We are, we are allowing others to modify, because this is an optimistic locking mechanism in MVCC. The other one is pessimistic. So now we are doing this, but then Alice cannot proceed anymore, because the salary, the read, is no longer consistent to what she has read before. So now, because of this, the database must figure out and will throw you an exception. So you can always get, if you're using a database, and nowadays most of them work in MVCC, you can always get exception, exception like this, which are naturally, they can happen naturally because of the flows uh, the user are working on the database. However, we have this situation here as well, where Alice reads the sum, Bob comes and issues the insert directly, and it works. And then the update works as well, so both can commit. Do you think this breaks serializability or not? Is this a problem or not? Now the budget is 108. From our application, it is a problem. But from the database perspective, do you think this breaks serializability? Blink twice if it's yes. Blink three times if it's no. <laughs> No, it does not break, because as I said before, serializability means to be equivalent to some serial execution. Here, the insert could happen afterwards. So that would be serialized. It would be Alice first, Bob second. So if, that, if we can arrange the reads and write like that, we would get the same outcome. So from the database, it's, uh, it's still equivalent to a serial execution. It means there is no conflict. It's only conflict for us from our application perspective. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Sometimes, because serializability does not imply an order in time, that might affect the way you reason about your application, because reason right might be reordered by your database. So this is how we get to, if you don't have serializability and you lower it, you get all sorts of anomalies called phenomena. And in the SQL standard, you don't have many of them. The, the, the standard says that you can only have dirty read, non-repeatable read, and phantom read, which is not true because you can have many of them. You have, actually, you cannot have dirty write because if you had, you did not have atomicity. But you can have read skew, write skew, and lost update. So let's see what they, those means because they're just some you no know, words written on, on a page. So what those mean? So dirty read means that if you have a record, someone modifies it, then you go and you read the unmodified record. If they commit, there's no problem. 
if they don't commit a rollback, now we are reading and using a record which does no longer exist in the transaction log. So we're taking a decision based on something which is not trackable anymore. It has existed, but now it does not exist. It was never acknowledged to, to, to be modified. So that's, that's where it can be a problem. Do you think of one use case where this one can be actually a feature, not a bug, to use something like that? Depending on the situation, an anomaly actually can be something which is really cool to have it, if you have it. So here, you can have a transaction, a batch process, which does some processing, and you have a different transaction, which is allowed to read dirty records, so you can display a progress bar. Because that one is allowed to read the progress of the other transaction without waiting for that one to come in. So sometimes, the bug can become the feature. Now, non-repeatable read, you start from a record, you read it, someone comes in, modifies it, and then you read it again and it has changed. And now what happened in between the first read and the second read? You might have taken some decision of something that has changed in between. So when you commit it, your reads are not stable anymore, which is exactly like we had there. Like we read, we read the, the balance and then we do the write and it has changed. That's non-repeatable read. Phantom read is the same, but it applies to ranges. So it's exactly like we had there with uh, employees in the department. You start, you read three comments here, someone comes in, adds another one, and then when you do the read, you, you will observe that your read is no longer the one that you read previously. And that's where the standard stops. But in reality, you have more. You have read skew, for instance. In read skew, you have to start, you need two rows, which needs to be synchronized. Like here, you have post and post details. When you issue a write to the post, you have to mark the person which uh, modified that record, the updated by. So here we are reading the post, and until we get to read the post details, someone comes in and modifies both of them. So by the time when we go back and we read the new post details, we will assume that the record with the title transaction was updated by Bob. But this combination never existed. It was either transaction updated by Alice, or as it updated by Bob. So we get a combination of records which is not consistent to how the data was updated in the database. And we also have write skew. This one, we start with the same two records, both transactions are going to read it, and then we want to modify here the title, but we're not going to update the post details because the post detail has not changed. Maybe we're using JPA, and in JPA, if you, if you don't modify an entity, it's not going to be updated. And then Alice does the same. She tries to modify the post because she got a request from their system where the title is still transaction, but she does not do the check to see if the title has not changed. She just updates both entities, but only the post detail has changed. So both are allowed to do the update, but then we will get a combination which never existed. We, we get a combination from one and the other. It, it will break our consistency check because our consistency, consistency rule was that these two records should always be modified synchronously. So when you have a modification, you should always mark the person who did that modification. And the last update, where you, you start from something, you, you read a record, someone comes in and commits, and then you modify, you overwrite it, and you are allowed to do this. That's the last update. It's like, for instance, when it's Black Friday, you saw MacBook Pro, and uh, uh, it was a good price, and then you order it, and when it comes to you, either you pay more, maybe the, the promotion is no longer, or it comes in a different color, which you did not want. So that would be like a lost update, because at the time of the commit, your reads are no longer what, uh, are, are no longer consistent to what you are going to place your order on. So that's where, they, in 92, they decided that because of serializability did not scale, which did, was not scaling because of locking, pretty much, they added in 92 this isolation property, which actually is a way to control concurrency, is a way to trade uh, correctness for performance. That's what you have. 
And the standard, again, is not very, uh, does not tell you the whole picture. It shows you just a subset of things that can go wrong. You only have three anomalies, and you have only four isolation levels. But the reality looks a little bit different. For instance, Oracle, you don't have all isolation levels. You have only read committed, and what they call serializable is just snapshot isolation, because in a serializable workflow, you would not get right skew, but you get. You get because even the, on the paper, it's you can demonstrate uh, you can demonstrate that if you're using if you're implementing snapshot isolation the way it is described in the paper, you cannot guarantee it to uh, to protect against the right skew anomaly. And in SQL Server, for instance, you see the four the first four are using are still using two-phase locking, so you get the exact. The, the, the exact set uh, that is in the standard. And the last two ones are with using NMVCC. So you see snapshot isolation is not, uh, not going to, it's not equivalent to serializable. And PostgreSQL, what you have re repeatable read in PostgreSQL is snapshot isolation. And then they added something more to it to make it serializable. So now their implementation is called serializable snapshot isolation. So they do extra checks. They check the transaction log across all transactions to figure out if there are any cycle between them. So if they detect a cycle, they will have to abort one transaction. And in MySQL, where repeatable read is sort of, this is INODB, is sort of like uh, snapshot isolation, which is weird because it allows lost update. And then for serializable, they just take locks. So it's just using adding two-phase locking on plus of MVCC. So of course, you get less performance, but at least you get correctness. And yeah, when, when they designed this, it, it was this era, you know? We had mainframes, we had COBOL. You know, in the paper, they talk about terminals, you know? Have you, have you seen a terminal with only memory? They didn't have disk. That's what it, I, I saw it my first year of, uh, of college. I, I, did not, I did not understand the concept, because back then we had computers anyway. So they used to have something like that, terminals connecting to, to mainframes, and they had a direct connection. So all your reads and writes always happen in the same transaction for as long as you want it to have two minutes, five minutes. However, this is not how we work anymore, because now our reads and writes can happen in different transactions. So now in the internet era, you cannot lock. If you read something, of course, you cannot lock it and go to, to serve a coffee and forget about that record, and no one can do any progress anymore. And also, you cannot, you, you, you cannot do a lot to guarantee serializability if your reads and writes are not in the same transaction. So because of this, as it is no longer sufficient, it's something more. For if you have application-level transactions where your reads and writes are split uh, among uh, multiple requests, then you also need some application-level concurrency control mechanism. Because if you don't do, it will happen something like this. So you read a product, the batch process comes, updates the quantity, and then when you try to buy it, the quantity becomes minus one, which is it's wrong because you don't physically have it in your in your warehouse. So you see here, even if you're using serializabil serializability, your, even if your database offers serializability, it will not help you much because you have different different transactions, physical transaction. So now the first thing that was wrong there that we didn't keep the state of what we read. So our read was not consistent. So now we keep our read. We we, we keep it in our session. So the batch process comes, updates the quantity to zero, and now when we decrease it, like we have Hibernate, an entity there, you decrease it from five to four, and then you merge it, and then you are going to have a lost update because now the, the product will jump from zero to four, which is still a no lost update. So in order to fix it, we have to do something like that. We have to use optimistic locking in the application. So you mark your entity or your rows with, with a version, and then the updates and the delete are going to take it into consideration. So you have the version in going to be incremented. So now you are going to have a linearizable way of all your writes are going to be linearizable because those insert can only be can only add up. They cannot jump backwards. So now you can even add the version there. So if you have a, an update count of zero, it can be for two reasons, either the record was deleted and you don't find it anymore by the ID, or the version has changed. So you can detect the lost update. So that's exactly how it works. Because you read the product, the batch process comes and updates it, and it increases the version. So now when you try to, to update it again, it will fail because your version does not match anymore. So 
that's a concurrency, an application level concurrency control mechanism, which you can use, which is plus to ACID to provide consistency. But then you st start having different kind of problems. Like here we have post, we have three properties and one version. So now you have three users, both are reading the post. One is doing the first update to the title property and they proceed. And then all the other updates are going to fail because the version has changed. However, the title, the likes and the views are not conflicting. So this is like a false positive. We are uh, increasing the number of rollbacks, but for no, uh, actually it does not bring us any benefit because we want to uh, get those, con those conflicts across sets of properties which are, should be treated atomically. So in order to fix it, you have two ways. Either you split the rise, so you have multiple one-to-one -one relations, like here. And then, of course, the rights go to different tables, so they will no longer conflict, and you can keep the version. So now when you have a conflict, you have for the title or those properties which are in the same table. So you can actually split. Use, you are practically introducing multiple versions through multiple tables. Or you can use this one in Hibernate. Have you ever heard of this annotation? Have you seen it in, your, in a project? It's very old, it's like 10, 12 years old. It's a lesser known one. It's optimistic locking dirty, where you don't keep the, the version, you can remove it. And the rights will not use the version, will use the previous version of the property. So when you're doing the update, you see you're setting the title, and you expect to find the title in the, in the same state that you read. So that's how you can get an optimistic locking. So this one will work, because those one will not conflict, uh, will not conflict uh, anymore. And in JP and Hibernate, actually, you can have more of them. You can even have the read writes are for, um, they have, um, th th they were renamed. Pessimistic read and write are for taking pessimistic shared and exclusive locks, the one used for two phase locking. And then the optimistic force increment and pessimistic force increment are just a way to increase the version number. So, for instance, this example demonstrate how optimistic force uh, increment works. So for instance, here you are modeling a system which is like uh, subversion. I don't know, do you remember working with subversion? Exactly. So yeah, if, if you remember working with subversion, you're not that young. <laughs> so now you have the version, what you want to do during each commit, you want to increase the version of the repository. So how can we do that? We are reading the record with optimistic force increment and then the other transaction does the same, but they can issue the, ins uh, the, the insert to, they can issue the commits, and at the end of the transaction, they update the repository, which we, actually, we did not modify the repository, but we are forcing the, its version to be incremented. So when the other transaction resumes, and they try to do the insert, it will fail during the update, because the version is no longer the one which we expect, so we have to do an update from. So th that's exactly how subversion used to work. So that's how you are using this, uh, you are using this mechanism in order, because the database might not, uh, might not help you, and you can even use this mechanism with lower isolation levels and provide the same, uh, some guarantees which are important to you. So actually, w if you think about time, we have it like that. We, we went full circle because at first we had strict serializability and then uh, MVCC offered snapshot isolation, which is a little bit lower, but still higher than other isolation levels. Then NoSQL did not have uh, a lot to offer in relation to transaction and data integrity. And now the new generation of databases, actually, they go back to serializability, you know, like Google Spanner, VoltDB, the CockroachDB, they also try to offer this one by default. So we went back because, for instance, even MongoDB now, uh, I think this is the version, I'm not sure if this is for the open source products or for the enterprise one, but they did support, you know, uh, in 4.0. So they say that it takes 10 years to build a relational database. So you see after 10 years, more or like they they got to add this concurrency. Uh, they actually got to to the point where probably it will not lose uh, data like you have it in a relational database. And that's the the same rationale for 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 Spanner as well. This is from the Google Spanner paper, where they said that uh, actually they 
uh, they would rather prefer to have performance bottlenecks due to overusing, abusing transaction rather than not having transaction and having to deal with problems generating by the lack of transaction, having to hunt down your event source uh, transaction log and figure out where those events went wrong and then came back with uh, compensating transactions. Okay, so what I want you to to take away from this conversation is that concurrency testing is important, as you see, so in the first example, just because you have tests and you are having something that is updating and uh, used in a concurrency environment, you have to have some concurrency testing to make sure that it works even when you have multiple threads and to understand how the database system works. Because, yeah, you, you use a system, if you don't understand it, you're going to have a lot of surprises. Uh, and usually you get to understand you will get a chance to understand it when it's a little bit too late because you have problems in production. So you go back and study so what, why it happens, why it happened like that. So then, yeah, of course, to understand what anomaly is because it, as you see, there are some anomaly that can happen, but it's not necessary that it will affect your application. You have to decide that on every and uh, on a use case basis because sometimes they can be a problem, at the time they might not be a problem. So pretty much, and if you have those anomalies, to understand what you can do to overcome them. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the conference. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank. You. One second to take a picture of you. And afterwards, you can ask me anything about Hibernate. One second. And I need a larger camera. <laughs> okay, so if you have questions, you can ask me about presentation. Or otherwise, on the whole, you can ask me about anything about Hibernate if you're using. You know the framework fi Hibernate? Anything about it. My <laughs> uh, headphone question. In case of... Oh. Here, right here. Uh, so in case of optimistic... Pessimistic locking? Uh, no, optimistic locking dirty. Mm -hmm. I imagine that we would like to write in the same field, mm -hmm. are we going to have optimistic work exception? Uh, you say when two transactions trying to write the same field? That yes. can never happen. That can never happen. Even in MVCC, that can never happen because you, you always take logs when you write something. Until you commit a rollback, you are not going to release that log. The reason why, uh, you, I, yeah, I didn't add that to, to, to the presentation. The reason, if you don't have that, you, you cannot guarantee atomicity. So then you are in a much better, much worse shape. So it, even no SQL database offer that. So every time you write something, you have to take a lock on it. So basically what you can allow is like readers, to allow reads to happen. But the writes are always linearizable because the transaction log has to be linearizable. If you read, actually the flow of events follow the flow in time. So that's why you need to, to use. So there are always going to be some locks. It's just how much, how, the, the amount of locks that you are going to take. So lo locks are not always bad. Thank you. Okay, if no more questions, thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference.